So our next talk is about the African family, a very important institution. And what are some of the things that we are going to be concerned about? We are going to look at Af traditional African family structures and kinship, types of family, the African family versus the European family or the Western family. The African family, is it a, a blessing or is it a hindrance? And then the African family, does it answer the needs of individuals as well as the needs of states? Okay. So these are the issues that are going to be of interest to us in this lecture. I will begin by looking generally at the family. The African family can be considered as the foundation of society and culture. And why is that so? Because individuals are born into a family, they grow up within a family, they are socialized to become responsible citizens within the context of a family. So though, fam though less is significant these days, the family still retains a lot of value for the African. And that is why newspapers carry all these long obituaries about dead people, okay? So these long obituaries are a celebration of the family. It also explains why when people die in certain places, we carry the corpse all the way hundreds of miles for it to be buried in the family grounds, okay? It is because the family beckons even when you are dead. So attachment to the family accounts for a variety of social and individual behavior patterns and attitudes. And that is why we need to look at it. So, well, basically there are a number of readings that you can do. You can read uh, my Fortis's small pamphlet on the family being a blessing. Uh, if you're interested in God family, you can read uh, the God family and social change. If you're interested in uh, uh, Eve family, you can read uh, Kinship and Marriage Among the Eve, uh, Anglo Eve. You can also read my own book on culture and development. And there's a lot that we have on the topic on the Sakai website. I advise you to look at that. So let us try to define family. What exactly is family? I would say that family is a group of related people, people who are related through blood ties, married ties, or by adoption and other fictions. Okay. There are also members who identify with each other and they may or may not live together. They may cooperate with each other on a regular basis or from time to time. It could also be that these people share a kind of collective interest as well as sentiment. So when we're talking about the African family, there is a kind of morality which culture imposes on us. And that is reciprocity, the need to share and to care for one another. They need to exhibit loyalty and commitment to other members of the family. And in fact, the closer the kinship bond, the stronger the commitment and the higher the degree of reciprocity that is expected to exist. In Africa, people in fact tend to boast about their family connections. Just as some people are ashamed to let people know what family they come from. So today we tend to compare the African family to the European family. And in doing so, some see the, European, the African family as a being, a hindrance to their development. But others, of course, see it as a blessing and an asset. But what I would say is that like most social institutions, the family has both aspects. It has both the positive and the negative within it. And it provides for choices. But it also denies people choices. If you consider the development is about choice, you can say that family provides for choices, but at the same time, there are times when the family denies us choice. It insists that you have to do things this way, okay? So if all this is true, then those of us who are interested in development and culture need to identify what the beneficial aspects of the family are, and when we have them, we capitalize on them for advancement of society. At the same time, we need to fathom the undesirable features that are associated with the family 
And when we find them, we do something about them. We seek remedies, okay? We can reject the negative. Yeah, that's one way of doing it. We can also modify the negative and make it positive. And in doing all this, let us always bear in mind something that was said in the earlier lectures, that culture is not sacrosanct. Culture is something which is dynamic. So if we need to change something, we go ahead and change it, and not say it's culture. No, culture doesn't prevent us from changing things, okay? Now, talking about family, we often hear a variety of labels talked about. We don't have the time to go into all of this, but we talk about extended family, we talk about the lineage, we talk about the clan, the conjugal family, the nuclear family, the simple family, the compound family, family of procreation, family of orientation, one parent family, matricofocal family, all kinds of labels. Are they the same thing? Are they different things? It is the same institution which is looked at from different perspectives. But one type of family that is critical is the nuclear family or the conjugal family. And this is a family which comes into existence as a result of marriage. It comprises husbands and wives as well as their children, if any. So it is a family of orientation that is a nuclear family, if you're looking at it from the perspective of the children, because they are being raised and groomed for life. But it's a family of procreation if you're looking at it from the perspective of the adults. And they are not, the family of orientation is not the same as the family of procreation uh, as far as the people are concerned. It is a family of procreation from the perspective of the parents who raise their children, the children born to them. An African man, therefore, may have more than one wife. That is possible. If that is so, his family of procreation does comprise a compound family. Okay? So, in this case, the family of uh, procreation ceases to be a simple one, but in fact a compound one. Now, we often hear talk of the extended family, what exactly is it? I would say essentially it's a network of relatives. It could be relatives that you count on the father's side, relatives that you count on the mother's side, both sides, or even people who, are, who fall outside the mother's side and the father's side. All of these can come together to constitute your extended family. And I would say the extended family is often large. It may or may not be formally constituted. It may or may not have a name. Its membership is open-ended, it's not closed. So we don't know exactly who and who belongs there. We know certain people belong there. But at the peripheries, there are more and more people who potentially can belong there. It often lacks a corporate identity in the sense that it never will meet at any particular point to do anything as a group. Okay? And in that respect, it's unlike the other types of families. Okay? Size and membership may well depend on the status of an influential individual who is the center of the network. Now, beyond the extended family, there's also something which some people refer to as the extended family, which is not. That is the lineage or the clan. In parts of Africa, importance is tied to tracing relationships through uh, your father or through your mother, through men or through women. And you can do this all the way to a common ancestor or ancestress. That group which we are mapping out in this kind of way forms what we call a lineage. So on the basis of such types, socially recognized groups of kin are constituted. So bear in mind that unlike the extended family, the lineage is recognized socially, okay? Thus, its members claim either a common ancestor or a common ancestress as their point of reference, okay? And they do so systematically, either through women, mothers, or through fathers, or through men, okay? And that is how these groups come into being. And the term that is used for it is the lineage. The clan is more or less a more extended uh, aspect of the lineage, you see. Uh, a lineage is an aspect of the clan. The clan is much, much, much larger, okay? 
So it is often a large lineage, if you like. Its membership is dispersed. And in some cases, they may never come together all the time or even know each other. Now, it's important to look at the features of the lineage. The lineages are more or less corporate. A lineage may have a name and a head person, and this person administers it. It may own property, yeah, jointly. Its members may meet periodically from time to time. And the lineages tend to defend themselves against everybody else, the encroachment of the rest of the world when it comes to their members and their rights. So when you understand what a lineage is, now you can look at the distinction between the matrilineage and the patrilineage. If you are an Akan, you want to know what a matrilineage is. Just recall that in Akan languages, there's a word called a bisouin. The bisouin, in fact, is a lineage, and that is a matrilineage. Okay? And you can see that members of the bisouin would include my siblings, okay, brothers and sisters, my mother, my mother's mother, my mother's siblings, that is men and women, my sister's children, okay, my sister and my sister's children, of course. But as a man, my own children are out of, out of it. They are not part of my abyssinian. So in other words, it, it uh, excludes spouses. So fathers, for example, may be out when you talk about a matrilineage, okay? So that is the kind of society, with, with the kind of group we're talking about. And it is important because it has a legal existence in our societies. It controls property. It controls power, okay? But it is not something that, as far as the matrilineage is concerned, it's not something you find in every society. The Akan societies have matrilineages, and that is why we call them matrilineal societies. In Africa, there are other societies which are like that. If you take the Yao, for example, they are matrilineal. The Bemba, they are matrilineal. The Lele, they are matrilineal. The Guru, they are matrilineal. So it's not only the Akans who are matrilineal. There are many other societies that are matrilineal. So if you can imagine what a, a matrilineage is, the middle opposite of this will be a patrilineage, where this time, it is importance is attached to the father and to men. So people who are affiliate with this group are people who are related to men. And wives don't come in here. So spouses are out, okay? If you have children, your sons are members of your party lineage, your daughters are part members of your party lineage, your sons' children are part of the party lineage, but your, sis your, 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 your daughter's children are out. Okay, so there are also societies which are like that. Examples would be the Kunkumba, the Frafra, the Eve, to a certain extent, the Gan, to a certain extent, the Yoruba, the Maasai, and many others in Africa. Now, having said all this, let us pause and ask ourselves, what are the similarities and differences between the African concept of family and the Western European notion? It is important to compare them because as I pointed out before, some people have the notion that to develop, we have to westernize. And I've made an argument that if you think that way, then it means that you're going to go and look for a western type of family and throw out the African type of family. But before you do that, let us understand what the differences are and so on and so forth. So if you compare it to, you find that the African family is more inclusive demographically, and it is larger. It is more collective, okay? And to the extent that it lends itself to a projection of a wider community, to the extent that in some systems, the whole community can be considered as a family writ large. That is the effect of the African idea of family. It is a concept which is so malleable, which is so flexible, you can extend it to cover so many people to the extent that sometimes they're not even members of the family in the, in the literal blood sense, but they are family to you. That is the nature of the African family. It is more sociolog sociological, that's it. It's more social. And you can see this when you look at the question of father. Who is a father? In the African context, in the European context, a father is the person who is biologically responsible for your birth. A man who is biologically responsible for your birth. That person is your father. But in the African context, 
it is not only that person who is your father. In fact, in some systems, that person may not even be your father at all. Your father may be somebody else, okay? So, you have not only one father, but so many fathers. Your father's brothers are also your fathers. Sometimes even your father's sisters are also your fathers. That's the nature of the African context, okay? It enables for wider sharing, okay? If you consider a traditional uh, nuclear family, you find that whereas the European notion, the Western notion, enjoys a lot of independence and autonomy, the African one has no independence, very little of it, in the sense that uncles and aunties and grandparents and so on and so forth continue to have a say in the affairs of the nuclear family. And that is so in many parts of the Africa, okay? So long as you have these people, they continue to, to, to have an interest in your family, even if it is you, your wife, and your children. They are also part of it, you know. In the European context, they are not. So in the African context, you find that the bond that exists between father, parent, and child is very strong, and not only strong, it's long-lasting. The sibling-sibling relationship is strong and lasting. The loyalty and commitment to your family is strong to the extent that it even outweighs our loyalties to the state. The African nuclear family, uh, I dare say, lives and grows through time. Okay? Whereas the European or the Western family wills with time. Okay? To the point that it gets to the point it dies off completely. The African family, nuclear family, does not die. It continues to grow. African expectation is that in terms of the family norms, is that parents will fend for their children and the children in turn will take care of their parents in their old age and their movements. This is the ideology. I'm not saying that everybody abides by that today, but that is the African ideology. So the African ideology emphasizes the family's political existence, its economic existence is legal character, is social character, is religious aspects, and so on and so forth. So it's not just something which has a narrow definition. It is an institution that is political, is religious, is legal, and so on and so forth. Now, the diagram that I have here shows us the reciprocities that exist between in the, within the African model and the European model. In the case of the African model, it is true reciprocity. A parent exchanges resources with the children. The children are expected to repay back, more or less. And that is how it is. In the European context, the parents have a duty to maintain their children, but the children do not have a corresponding duty to maintain their parents. Okay? So in the case, I, I call the European model uh, a kind of real, relay reciprocity. That is, you just take the baton and don't look back. In the case of the African, you take the baton and look back and examine the person who gave it to you. That is the difference. And I can have summarized the intergenerational reciprocities by saying that they have a saying which says, you look after a child to grow its teeth so that it would in turn take care of you until you lose your teeth. Losing your teeth means when you die. And in the African context, even death does not stop the reciprocities because when your father dies, he becomes an ancestor. You continue making sacrifices and commemorating that person. So in other words, the reciprocities continue. And the dead person is also supposed to take care of you. That is the nature of our religion. So there are implications. The implication is that the African context has got collective support. Okay? So it's a system that supports the needy. So it provides psychological and social support, as well as security, where in a, in a context, where in, in an individualistic context, where it pays to have a brother who will take care of you when you are in need. So it could be that it is the means for coping with misfortune, with tragedy, and other problems of life. Premature death, for example, the death of a spouse, infertility, aging, illness, all of these are taken care of by the African family. So when I talk about the needy, we may ask ourselves, but who are the needy? So the needy are many. The orphan is needy because this person has lost both parents. 
So who is going to care for it? The widow is needy. She has lost her husband, the breadwinner. The widower is also needy because that person has lost a wife and maybe too, too, too old to marry again. The aged, too old and too infirm. So all of these people are needy. And I'm saying that the family is there to take care of them. So it takes care of the orphan because your father has died, your mother has died. But you have many mothers. You've got many fathers, so you're not lost. In the Western system, what they do is they push into a, an orphanage. We could also do that in, in, in Africa. The only problem is that our states are not strong enough to support orphanages. They don't have the means to do it. They don't have the willpower to do it. Okay? You could also do that. But it is easier when the family comes in voluntarily to take care of the orphan. The same also applies to the widow, although I'm not going to illustrate this, but you can see for yourself. The widower too. You are a widower, the family will provide a wife for you. They will take care of you. The aged, well, you've got children. You may be sick. You may lack the strength to work. But your children are there. They will, they will help out. The person who is childless, well, childless, no problem. You want a child, fostering. And in some African systems, fostering is mandatory. It's not a choice. Okay, compulsorily, you have to foster. Okay, don't keep all the children to yourself. Let your brother also have some of them. That is the message of fostering. And they will even add a religious injunction. If you don't do that, something will happen, I mean, unfortunately will happen to the children or to yourself. Okay, so these are some of the things that one can say as far as an aspect of the family is concerned. Thank you. But we'll talk more about the family.